uh, in this uh, 10th inter-hospital sharing. So this is a platform between the medical communities and technical communities. And this provides a platform to share experiences and new knowledge uh, between and among uh, the practitioners and inventors. So today we have a two presenter. The first presentations will be delivered by Dr. Uday Koirala. Uh, he is an executive committee member of uh, Telemedicine Society of Nepal, and he is also associated with Kathmandu Model Hospital. And he is also an uh, uh, active uh, participant and active an activist for telemedicine in Nepal. So he will share something about telemedicine in Nepal. Are we ready to continue and strengthen? And the second presentation, we have uh, Professor Dr. Suresh Manander. He is a reader and head of artificial intelligence research groups at the Department of Computer Sciences, University of York. So he will talk about using artificial intelligence to deliver low-cost quality healthcare in developing countries. So uh, we'll have uh, around uh, 25 minutes time for the, his presenters. So I think uh, our uh, the, the plan time is a little bit extended. So first of all, I uh, I would like to request Dr. Uday Koirala to begin his presentations. Okay, sir. Over to you. Okay. Oh, thank you, Rajanji. So today my topic of presentation will be telemedicine in Nepal. Are we ready to continue and strengthen? Uh, in the screen you can see two great people. Uh, my Virpun sir and Dr. Dital. So I would like to say them as father of telemedicine for Nepal. And uh, actually it was started with Nepal Wireless, I think. So connecting hills of Magdi by Mahavir uh, Punsha. And this telemedicine is a project which has no budget, no guideline, no support staff. Uh, and a lot of problem, I think. So it's a photo of the first long-range testing in 2002 at Moare. It's in Magdi, and we can see Marvin Poons are there. And these are the long-range connection. You can see the towers in the tree, radios in the tree. Tree. Right? In the roof and on the poles. So, on the website of uh, Nepal Research Education Network, also you can see this telemedicine. Actually, we have started in 2006. Uh, first connection was with Kathmandu Model Hospital and Gauri Central General Hospital in Dolakha. We were having regular classes, morning classes, morning conferences with Dolakha at that time. And more than 13 remote areas like Trishuli, Zomsom, Magdi, Makwanpur, Sindhupalzo, Kabre, Atsam, Bajura, all these were connected. And Kathmandu Model Hospital was leading this telemedicine connection the remote areas. Actually, we want to have our foot on the earth and want to touch the sky. That means we also want to reach the remote areas through telemedicine. And also we want to learn something from the uh, advanced technology from uh, abroad. So we want to connect the developed countries developed cities with our remote uh, inaccessible places. We also were having regular oncology classes with Kansas University, University of New Mexico. So why I am saying was 
was because now we have very few connections. Actually, maybe in 2011, that time, we had so many connections uh, in the remote areas, uh, like the uh, Trisuli, Mokwanpur, Sindhupal, many areas of Kavre, uh, and also Bajura, Acham, those, those were all connected. Uh, and now, the enthusiasm of telemedicine, uh, I think, is, is decreasing than that time. Now also we are having regular video session with Korea, Japan, Malaysia through uh, Vietnam, Singapore through APAN, that is Asia Pacific Advanced Network Medical Working Group. And we are having live video presentations, live discussions, uh, and also case presentations. You can see uh, it's the time of globalization through telemedicine. There are so many places connected together. And we were happy to organize first National Telemedicine Workshop in 2016. Uh, Nepal Research Education Network and Telemedicine Society of Nepal jointly organized this workshop. And there were many telemedicine activists who were who participated in this program. But after that, our connection was lost again. Uh, there are many participants from East, West, or far, far Western part of our country. Uh, but again, the connection is lost. Uh, we have established the Center for Rural Health and Telemedicine uh, in Kirtipur, where we are also uh, jointly organizing this inter-hospital sharing uh, program. And through telemedicine with Dolikal Hospital, Patan Hospital, CUTH, uh, NAMS, Bail, Pata, Dolkha, Puchan. So if we look back to the history of the telemedicine of Nepal, uh, in government sector, maybe 2011, Prime Minister Madhav Kumar Nepal he inaugurated the SART Telemedicine Center uh, in Patan, and more than 25 uh, district hospitals are connected to this network, and mainly store and forward, that is through email, this uh, telemedicine connection is there. And last time I had asked Dr. Arvind Joshi, who had worked in Patan Hospital, uh, about the activity there, and he said, uh, Maybe only one or two uh, consultation was done in a month, surgical consultation. Uh, and this video conference may be better than store and forward. Uh, and BPKIHS Taran also started this telemedicine services in 2015. Uh, there was tel telemedicine training in Dankuta. And we can see also these uh, ICT personnel, engineers, participating in telemedicine, presenting their presentations in telemedicine. And there are certain publications as, as well in journal about telemedicine for rural and underserved, underserved communities of Nepal. And uh, long distance medicine. Uh, there are different papers from HealthNet Nepal also. Um, and when we, I just searched on telemedicine in Nepal, I found there are many volunteers from states and Europe who are organizing different projects uh, at different parts of Nepal. Uh, so th this was from states, Nepal Youth Initiative, who were working at Kalikot. And there is one Ask Foundation, who also participated in this telemedicine workshop. Uh, Ask Foundation, they are working mainly in Western region, uh, Dolpa, Humla, and now they are trying to uh, expand their service in Dading and Raswa. 
I also could see paper from our Rajanji. Uh, he had done some research that uh, telemedicine reduces gender-based barriers to access healthcare and mobile phones offer anonymity that enables sexual and reproductive health discussions uh, among females who feel shy to come up in video conferences. And there was a term given like telemedicine in Gulmi district where GP was connected with uh, other remote health workers uh, were connected to district hospital GP and uh, the telemedicine that is telephone or mobile phone used for telemedicine uh, we all know that this telemedicine it is very important we all realize that it is a very uh, needed needy in rural and remote areas uh, but there is always a problem it's not been our priority uh, and we also we always try to escape from telemedicine maybe because of funding because of the sustainability uh, and other social and political issues there are theses in telemedicine also uh, from different parts like this was in Finland I saw some papers from Denmark and our Rajanji he did thesis from Thailand uh, there are private partners as well last time when we were having teleconference in surgical society uh, everyone was saying that okay we are also practicing this telemedicine uh, like home hospital they will say we were practicing for, for many years. Uh, there was Dale uh, Baidi from BNB Hospital. He was also saying, okay, this is, we are also practicing this for many years. So, yeah, we know everyone is practicing, but I think this type of uh, telemedicine projects it should be united. We should unite together uh, so that uh, it will be more fruitful was the needy people and Nepal Cancer Hospital they are also uh, they also have plan to uh, uh, develop satellite centers to all centers all cities and to provide expert consultation uh, there is a paper in this critically ill patient that is in ICU management, tele, use of telemedicine in ICU management. And there was a very interesting finding that uh, most of the staffs, in house staff, they were against the telemedicine because they don't want others to monitor their work. And similar, maybe. <coughs> the scenario in our remote areas because if we connect directly through telemedicine to the centers and patient may also would like to directly contact with the specialist in the centers uh, and maybe the health workers or doctors at the site uh, may feel inferiority so this may be the problem so there are certain studies. Most failures of telemedicine programs are associated with the human aspects of implementing telemedicine. Uh, we know this is important, but we may not be that ready to dedicate ourselves to telemedicine, uh, to dedicate some time, uh, dedicate some effort towards telemedicine. So the human factors that appear to underlie the rejection or limited acceptance of telemedicine, telecommunication and information technology by otherwise interested clinicians and administrators. So we find many interested groups, but still we don't think telemedicine is growing that much. Uh, Beer Hospital also started telemedicine in 2018 and it's 
always a big news in newspapers. Uh, and there is a, another very good study, Opportunities and Challenges of a Rural Telemedicine Program in Nepal. Uh, it was from Patanus Hospital, I think. Overall attitude of the stakeholders involved in delivering telemedicine services was favorable. However, several loopholes were reported in the existing system. Hence, it shows sufficient potentialities of rural telemedicine to improve the healthcare delivery in rural and inaccessible areas. So we have different choices like email for supplies, store and forward, video conferencing, telephone for medical consultations, and we can choose any one, but we have to know which one is the best. Uh, it must be user friendly so that every health workers can use it easily. We all know we have the problem of power cut and interruption in internet. I live in Bakar. When we try to start, there was power cut, there was uh, interruption in internet. Still, we say now we are free of load setting, but we still we have load setting. And there are, of course, problems with internet, with delays in passing emails and necessary supporting documents for the specialist consultation. And how do remote they perceive? They all think that uh, video conferencing is most effective and we should continue, but maybe some of the health workers or doctors at remote area, they feel inferiority if they connect patient directly to the specialist in the center. Uh, most of them, they of course have positive uh, perceive. Rural Elements in service and supported patients to get appropriate care and consultation, especially to those patients who cannot afford to travel to get the specialist services. Uh, travel cost, all the costs will be saved by this telemedicine. But of course, it will be additional burden of work to the health workers. Last time we were connecting with Dr. Chitis and there was problem in internet. So there is problem in electricity that usually happens. And paramedics and nursing staff, if we go to the lower level staffs, they think this, uh, this is something that uh, higher, uh, higher level of, uh, higher, how do you say, higher, higher level staff should be involved in this program. But uh, in MAGDI, if uh, we go back to MAGDI, there is a health worker who is not actually, was not actually properly trained as CMA or AM. We just trained for six months at that one model hospital. She went back and she was communicating well through polycom device. So if they are trained and they, if they have dedication, then it's not necessary that they have to know all the computer skill, all the medical terminologies, or all, all good English are necessary. Or let's say Nepali ma pani kura garan sabhi unsa, or say simple polycom device ma, or say simple technology ma, or say simple unsa. So we have to simplify the technology, and we have to reach to the uh, root level health workers and patients. So most of them, they were not happy with electricity and the internet service because of frequent disconnection. And because of that, even in video conferences, these images were blurry, sound was not clear. There is no technical expertise, no efficient infrastructure, train human resource and supporting environment. And if you need maintenance, then it will take weeks to months to maintain the equipment and software. And 
uh, there was a study where people who are involved or who are requested to continue this telemedicine, they, they would try to avoid their responsibility uh, because it's like time consuming. We really have to thank our engineers who are dedicated to continue uh, to establish and develop this telemedicine program in Nepal. They are the ones who give hours and hours to establish to continue uh, this type of services. Of course, we know we don't have governmental coordination. Uh, there are certain times when uh, government, certain personnel are interested to promote telemedicine, uh, but that is not uh, lasting for a long time. So still we have to uh, go and uh, speak with government personnel to continue to establish or to support these telemedicine programs. Now there are local governments and every uh, wards they will have health centers and these all health centers should have telemedicine services. But still to start off with uh, the uh, organization like Nepal Research Education Network, uh, organization like Kathmandu Model Hospital, and we people, actually we are the human factors, and we should continue to dedicate uh, towards this telemedicine service. Then only slowly uh, this will continue, this will strengthen. So th there are the times of frustration as well, disappointment as well. But if we unite, there are certain uh, certain areas like uh, in eastern parts, this Tehran, BPKHS, they are working well in the eastern part. Ask Foundation, they are working well in the western parts. Uh, there are other or other projects also. Last time, Dr. Manor Lal Sreshta was also talking about uh, their project in Borkha district, very remote area. So we should be united and know the difficulties uh, and challenges in telemedicine so that we can improve together. And we can unite together so that the difficulties can be overcome. So mainly the frustrations are because of the modern technologies, they may make, make our services more difficult. So that is a fear. They may add stress to our life. So it should be the preferences of, according to the preferences of consumers and providers from user side, like from patient, practitioner, uh, community, rather than technology driven perspectives. So this was my presentation and I want to make it more interactive. So if you have any suggestions, any comments, your aspects of telemedicine, please, please share. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Koirala, for your uh, wonderful presentations about uh, telemedicines in Nepal, the challenges and opportunities as well. So yeah, the floor is open for the discussions if we have. Uh, can I ask a question? Sure, sure, sure. So I think the, the last point you mentioned, uh, I found it very interesting. Uh, you said that, you know, um, uh, for better adoption of technology, uh, for telemedicine technology, it should be more user driven as opposed to technology driven. So I wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get inside that perspective a bit more because that's a very important point, you know. So I want to give an example like, uh, you know, you, you look at Facebook and how uh, people in villages uh, use Facebook. 
And Facebook is a fairly uh, sophisticated technology. Um, so there's an example where technology, uh, very modern technology is being used by villagers which are, who are not uh, very well educated in English and uh, not uh, computer savvy. Um, so, um, so, in, so from, from the point of uh, tele, telemedicine, so what is what is your view? You know, how can uh, modern technology be made uh, more uh, user friendly? So, what is the current barrier, right? Uh, thank you, Dr. Suresh. So. Yeah, the, the main theme is that it should be it should be user friendly. It will be in a, initially it will be technology driven, but if you make it more complicated, the technology also, then then the technology itself will die. As you also gave the example of Facebook, if it is easy to use, user friendly, then of course. Uh, it will it will develop, and especially for doctors who are not that much uh, acquainted with the technology of information and this management. So I think like some switches or just on and off if you do, and the telemedicine is started. So we would like to have those type of devices so that I just go make on and I, I just can continue to talk. So those type of buttons uh, may be helpful to us. Yeah, so so yeah, so I think so, the yeah, important yeah. point there is that it is not the case that, you know, um, it, it, it is, uh, there is a fear of uh, new technology, uh, but uh, it is the case that the new technology should be extremely user friendly. Yeah, can I add something? Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It was uh, it was uh, really um, informative. Um, you you tried to touch so many things in one uh, presentation, uh, from policy to hardware to use case to everything, and uh, well, um, it wasn't very. Um, some of the concepts uh, were, I think, uh, were not very clear. I was not very clear. Uh, but I agree with your, your point that it has to be uh, user-friendly, as said. And, and the way I um, mention or express this is uh, that should be at the point of care consultation. That then only would be used, like, if I'm in... Uh, in my outpatient clinic and then I have to go all the way down where my polycom setup is, the motivation is killed, all right? So uh, that should be where it is, the care is being given. That should be point of care consultation. And I give you an example. Uh, so sometimes when I consult with you guys, I directly do that from my OPD. I take a picture and use NCEL and I use Viber to send it. Send it. So I don't need a sophisticated, sophisticated setup. I just need a dedicated data line uh, and, and a smartphone. So I, and also telemedicine could mean anything. Like uh, you, you can you can talk on a phone and then consult, and you can have a video conference that requires a lot of investment and all. So we, it depends what what is your target, like and what you want to have as, as an outcome. I think that also is an important aspect. And the other aspect is that um, since you are a surgeon and I also do surgery and we consult for uh, surgery and all, um, telemedicine just acts as intermediary in some use case because the ultimate outcome depends on the person who is consulting with you. And and um, the, the, uh, the consultation is, if the consultation is made more easier, and uh, more to the, uh, to, to the point of care, then it will be uh, really um, facilitate the whole uh, 
um, intent of um, having the telemedicine in the first place. So this is uh, another example. I, I did a surgery a couple of days ago on, uh, on a very old uh, humerus fracture. And then I was consulting with a, a doctor in Berlin. He used to come to here. He's a, he's a trauma surgeon, kind of my mentor. And I, we used to talk on WhatsApp. And when I was doing the surgery and I asked him to, uh, to keep his phone nearby so that I could call him uh, on WhatsApp. Um, so he had this uh, WhatsApp on um, uh, and with, uh, with iPhone and then I was doing the surgery and I had some difficulty and then I had some question to ask and clarify and I could talk to him. And I, I asked one of my assistants to take picture in the theater and then send that picture directly uh, to WhatsApp. And then he saw the picture and then commented back and then asked me to do certain things and I immediately uh, changed a uh, few things. Meaning, uh, again, if it's not at the point of care delivery, it's uh, the use case and the intent probably wouldn't be as, uh, as big. That's, uh, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah, uh, yes, yes, uh, I do agree with you. And um, we, we can use whatever, uh, whatever mode we have uh, at the at the scene, no? Uh, but the video conferencing, being a surgeon, like video conferencing, uh, it is uh, uh, how to say? It is really different than like store and forward or like mo so using mobile apps. If you want to see uh, smaller structures and live videos, then maybe video conferencing would be better. And also for many patients who would like to see and talk to the doctors uh, or show some lesions then maybe video conferencing is better. Uh, but any, any sort of uh, technology that you have, uh, you can use, of course. Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Koyala and Dr. Chitis. Uh, so you, you shared very wonderful information. So uh, this will be very uh, 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 benefited information for us, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll keep follow up on this issue. So I think now uh, the time to go to the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Suresh is waiting for the presentations. So Suresh, sir, I think, that, yeah. Uh, uh, can I ask you a question? I have a question before Suresh begins. Okay. Okay, well, I'm just trying to understand uh, the economics of telemedicine. You know. mm -hmm. I know it requires a lot of infrastructure uh, from uh, equipment to connectivities and all that in rural areas, right? And um, I'm just trying to understand if um, uh, it is uh, going to either um, any money making provision or money losing provision if telemedicine is, is, or is it all about uh, saving life, treating uh, health services? services? Or who is paying for it? You know, just trying to understand the simple economics of television here. Yes, yes thank, you, thank you for your input. Uh, so, yeah, actually, we will have uh, some time uh, later the, uh, after the presentations of Professor Shores. So, so, I think yeah, I'd like to request. Uh, just for the presentations, sure, sir. Okay, uh, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, <coughs> waiting to listen to my presentation. So, um, <clears throat> so just to give you some background. So first of all, um, I am not a medical doctor. Um, so I am a computer scientist, and I've been uh, working uh, within artificial intelligence in the UK for the past uh, 30 years. Um, so currently I head the Artificial Intelligence uh, Research Group here at the University of York. Uh, so my main focus is on uh, machine learning. Um, and in the last uh, two years or so, 
I've been uh, extremely interested in the applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And I have uh, started doing some projects in Nepal in this area. And uh, so I've been thinking uh, very hard in terms of how uh, AI could be used to address actually some of the questions that had just been raised. Uh, so it is uh, quite nice and surprising that actually uh, some of the questions that have just been raised were actually the questions I've been thinking about. And uh, uh, it's also the solutions to some of these questions is something I've been working towards, okay? Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about how uh, AI can be used to deliver uh, low-cost healthcare in countries such as Nepal, and also how we can extend uh, the outreach of the existing health centers and telemedicine centers uh, to populations which are currently out of reach. And the point that had just been mentioned just now, you know, how do we uh, uh, provide, uh, as just been said, point of care services, right? So I think that's uh, extremely important. So, um, <clears throat> so I think these are things that have just been mentioned already. So the current uh, challenges in telemedicine. So from what I can see, um, existing uh, telemedicine requires an infrastructure cost. And currently, you know, only the big hospitals or NGOs can uh, provide this cost. So you need to have, a, you know, reliable internet connection for video conferencing. You need to have the equipment. And you need to have trained staff. Uh, uh, train manpower, etc. Right? Um, yeah, and there's also issue of sustainability. I'm uh, kept some notes here, so there is an issue about sustainability of these uh, services. By the way, uh, please interrupt me anytime. Okay? Uh, so I think I, I want this uh, talk to be reasonably interactive. So you don't have to wait until the end of the talk. <clears throat> So, yeah, so I just mentioned that already. We also need high-speed internet, which may be problematic uh, in a lot of places. Mm. The other point, and this is relating to point of care, is that, you know, uh, telemedicine requires uh, doctor-patient synchronization, <clears throat> which is uh, an issue because, you know, the doctor might be in Kathmandu and the patient might be in uh, some remote location. And the two need to be present at the same time in a telemedicine center. So we know that doctors are extremely busy people and trying to get hold of them in that uh, very, uh, you know, small time window might be a difficult uh, thing to achieve. So ideally speaking, you know, we, we would like uh, this synchronous communication uh, to be only needed uh, for a very limited number of cases. In most cases, we want uh, this communication to be asynchronous, right? Uh, so that means the doctor should be able to provide uh, guidance, assistance, et cetera, even from his bedroom. So again, you know, uh, <clears throat> telemedicine doesn't uh, translate into uh, delivering uh, patient care uh, to the patient home. Uh, telemedicine requires the patient to travel to the telemedicine center, okay? So we currently have maybe 20 or 30 or 40 telemedicine centers in Nepal, but that would not cover, you know, on the 90% of the population. So the, in terms of rural coverage, that coverage is extremely slow, uh, extremely limited. So ideally we want to, you know, provide uh, point-of-care services uh, for a lot of, especially for a lot of routine care scenarios uh, to the majority of the population. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so firstly, uh, before I go into um, how, you know, my vision is in terms of how we can provision these care, uh, these kind of care services, I want to talk about uh, some of the case studies. Though some of these case studies I'm involved with, and some of these case studies I'm not involved with, okay? Uh, but I want to talk about certain case studies which I think are relevant uh, in a developing country such as Nepal. 
So the first uh, case study is a, a project uh, that has been funded uh, by the UK government. And we are uh, currently working with Willick Hill Hospital. And what we are doing is that we are using a smartphone-based um, <clears throat> non-mydriatic camera uh, for diabetic retinopathy screening, OK? So we have a camera that can be attached to an iPhone, OK? It permits image capture and upload to a server, OK? So uh, even this basic uh, device uh, is useful because uh, this equipment can be carried by hand uh, to any uh, location. And when the internet become available, internet becomes available, uh, the data can be uh, tr transmitted uh, to a server uh, in a hospital. And the doctor can, you know, uh, the specialist can look at the image and then provide recommendation. Just like uh, has been mentioned earlier, even by using Viber, for example, or some other, you know, instant messaging app. So uh, the question is, uh, what is it we're doing in this project? So what we are trying to do is that we are trying to develop an AI solution for automated diagnosis. So what we are actually trying to build is an instant diagnosis software that will run on the phone itself. So as soon as a, a, fo a photo of the retina is taken, um, we want to uh, provide an instant diagnosis, OK? So you can see here uh, in these images uh, these rectangles. And this, uh, each of these rectangles correspond to uh, different eye conditions. So for example, uh, we have uh, these green colored ones. Uh, these are retinal microaneurysms. Uh, we have the uh, dark blue ones, which are retinal hemorrhages. Uh, we have the light blue one, which are hard exudates, and so on, OK? And what we're building is a, a custom designed uh, deep neural network. Um, uh, so this is a, a state-of-the-art uh, AI machine learning solution. But the key point about this uh, solution is that it runs uh, on the phone itself as an app. It does not require an internet connection, OK? So, uh, so the healthcare worker um, can uh, do the diagnosis. Uh, we do not require, we will, it, we will not require a specialist ophthalmologist. And uh, the, the simple uh, idea here is that we want to tell the patient whether the patient needs to see a specialist or not. Uh, because we can imagine in a rural healthcare scenario that, you know, if a non-specialist is looking at the uh, retinal uh, retina of, of a patient, uh, you know, he or she may not detect anything. And then, uh, you know, the patient might be told, you know, come back in two months' time and so on, okay? So the, by the time the, the patient is told that, you know, uh, his eye condition is now serious, he needs to go uh, and see, uh, visit a hospital, his eye condition would have deteriorated significantly, okay? So we want to provide early preventive uh, diagnostics such that, you know, we want to shorten the time the patient would otherwise take to visit a hospital. So that's the only purpose, the sole purpose of this project. So by the way, do you have any questions on that? Uh, I'll be happy to take, take that on right now. OK, thank you. Moving on. So the next uh, study uh, that I've been involved with is on breast cancer. So as you know, uh, breast cancer is also a major cause of uh, cancer-related diseases for affecting women primarily, uh, but men also to a limited extent. And uh, so we are developing automated AI-based solutions uh, for detecting breast cancer. Okay. So you can uh, see uh, some images here of uh, different uh, breast cancer conditions. Uh, another one. So uh, some of these are, you know, relatively easy to detect. 
some of these, uh, especially in this uh, image, is actually quite hard uh, for a non-specialist to detect. Okay. So what we're doing is that we are training our machine learning algorithms to automatically detect uh, different uh, breast cancer conditions. And currently, uh, we want to be able to say whether the image is normal or it's a, there's a tumor, but it's a benign uh, mass, uh, or it is a malignant uh, mass, or there is a benign calcification, or whether there's a malignant calcification. Okay. And what we have achieved is that we are currently close uh, to an expert, uh, but not, uh, we are still not as good as an expert. But the key point is that, you know, AI technology and accuracy of these systems keeps on impro improving. So with more data and better uh, AI software solutions, we would expect uh, these kinds of solutions to approach uh, very close to the accuracy of an expert radiologist. And we believe that, you know, if we can, for example, run this kind of software on a smartphone, uh, it will be very ideal for remote diagnosis. And also, it is also very, very suitable for training scenarios, right? So we want to do training uh, purposes. So another uh, case study, so this is uh, not something I'm uh, currently involved with. So this is a, a technology that has been developed in IIT Bombay. So IIT Bombay has developed um, a 3D uh, femoral reconstruction from biplane x-rays, okay? So the idea here is that, you know, um, so to do a 3D reconstruction of, uh, of the bone, uh, typically uh, you need uh, a CT scan, okay? But as you know, uh, CT scanners are very, very expensive. So, uh, so there is uh, quite a bit of research going on at this point in time uh, where uh, people are looking at uh, taking two x-ray images at the right angles to each other, okay? So there are just two um, uh, x-rays being taken uh, at right angles to each other. And the idea is to, <clears throat> uh, idea is to use a model-based re reconstruction to uh, reconstruct uh, the 3D model of the bone structure, okay? So this approach only works uh, for uh, specific parts of the body. So for example, if we're going to do a uh, 3D reconstruction of the leg, uh, then you need a model, you need to train the system uh, just for that, for the leg. So if you want to do it for arms, you need uh, to train it separately for the arms. Um, but uh, it provides uh, a, a massive cost savings for routine orthopedic cases. So you can imagine a scenario where you have a low cost uh, x-ray solution in a remote location and, you know, um, and uh, we want to be able to simply say to the patient whether uh, there's a fracture or not and whether, you know, he needs to go to the hospital or not, okay? So for those type of cases, uh, we can uh, use these type of solutions. Also now, um, uh, there's a lot of work going on on uh, low-cost pathology. So as you know, uh, having a pathology lab in a remote location is going to be quite expensive, okay? And it is not just the infrastructure cost, but it is also, you know, the lack of trained manpower. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, nowadays you can get very cheap, uh, low-cost USB connected mic microscope that are ready, readily available. Okay, so as has been already said, uh, if somebody is able to, somebody is, uh, we can train some people to just uh, produce these uh, uh, slides that could be put on a microscope, and then these images could be sent uh, to the expert. Uh, in, in the main hospital in Kathmandu, for example, and the expert can provide the diagnosis, okay? So that way, um, uh, it, it solves two problems. One is that the patient does not need to travel to the main hospital. And second 
is that you know uh, even if uh, you're trying to transport the sample itself to the main hospital um, uh, the sample itself may be destroyed uh, you know due to the time uh, required to take it to the main hospital okay so uh, we try to address these two issues by using uh, digital um, uh, microscopes obviously uh, this does not fully solve all the use cases okay um, and uh, so we still need a full lab uh, because uh, using these kinds of techniques you can only address uh, certain cases uh, which can be solved using a using a microscope <clears throat> and also uh, I think the key point here is that you know if we integrate uh, all of this imaging uh, into a uh, electronic uh, medical record system it allows the experts to analyze the data remotely um, so I'm going to come to that in a second um, and furthermore um, just like in the case of breast cancer and diabetic retinopathy we can build AI solutions um, that can provide instant diagnosis in the remote location and uh, these diagnoses again uh, can be run on a smartphone okay so um, and given that the smartphone has got uh, uh, data uh, transfer capabilities uh, that data can be uh, transmitted by the smartphone itself into the hospital and this is obviously currently a hot area for a lot of AI researchers to build uh, you know high accuracy uh, automated uh, pathology uh, solutions. So another uh, key uh, important uh, uh, thing I believe is biometric identification. So as we all know, face recognition is now available in Facebook. So that shows that it is possible to run face recognition on the phone uh, without uh, requiring a server access. Although you know, I believe that uh, the Facebook uh, actually does. Uh, a lot of the uh, uh, face recognition uh, using your internet so it doesn't actually do it on your phone but there are uh, face recognition software available which runs on the phone itself so why is this useful well the reason uh, uh, this is useful is that currently uh, the problem is that you know every time a patient visits a hospital the patient visits a uh, a different uh, health post or health center uh, the data the patient data is not reconciled so the doctor is not able to see a patient record um, <clears throat> because the patient has visited a different hospital so uh, so that means you know a lot of uh, information is lost uh, it's not available to the doctor because uh, the the patient uh, because the doctor doesn't have the historical information and even within the same hospital uh, because of misspelling of names or forgotten patient IDs uh, the patient data is not reconciled so hence uh, a large number of records are lost within current systems uh, in developing countries even if they use an EMR system and a lot of the hospitals are using an in-house EMR system but despite that, a lot of uh, patient data is lost. <clears throat> so one solution, obviously, is to uh, easy to integrate uh, smartphone-based biometric identification, for example, face or palm, and then uh, automatically uh, reconcile uh, patient data using uh, these biometrics. And this will remove the need for creating new records uh, for revisits. Okay. So, um, so in terms of how we can put it all together, how can we put all of these technologies together in a developing country setting, uh, taking advantage of the advances in AI, uh, with the aim of lowering the cost, with the aim of uh, providing point of care services, with the aim of providing you know, uh, uh, high uh, 80, 90% outreach, at least for routine 
care scenarios. Uh, how can we put all of these together? Okay, the first thing we want to do is that we want to avoid unnecessary visits to see a doctor. Uh, quite often, um, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, <clears throat> if the patient is able to provide um, his or her, her health condition using a smartphone, um, then the doctor can tell the patient whether the patient needs to come and visit the doctor. So we want to be able to, you know, just use a phone uh, to provide, uh, to reduce the number of unnecessary visits. So that way it increases the doctor's availability. So, so the doctor is able to see the patient even from uh, his or her home. And it reduces the cost, okay? So it reduces the cost for the patient, uh, uh, reduces the cost of the doctor, it reduces the cost of, of the infrastructure needed. So that way we can, uh, the, the system as a whole can serve more patient with the, with the same amount of infrastructure with the existing infrastructure. <clears throat> so how we can uh, do this? Well, what we need to do is that we want to be able to securely manage and transfer electronic health records. So we want the patient to be able to say, okay, uh, I want to you know, be able to send my health record to the doctor and the doctor is able to see uh, the, uh, the health record uh, instantly, okay? So we want um, <clears throat> the patient to have ownership of the data. Uh, we want uh, that data to be available through an app and the patient should own that data, right? Um, and the patient should be able to uh, send that data to multiple doctors, uh, you know, remotely. And the doctor should be able to asynchronously, you know, uh, provide um, uh, suggestions, provide diagnosis to the patient uh, at his or his or her own time, yeah, if needed. So you know, um, <clears throat> so the doctor doesn't need to necessarily come to the telemedicine center or the hospital to provide this advice. <clears throat> so how can we achieve this? Well, the only way we can achieve this is we can achieve this through a standards-based uh, electronic health record system. So we, we need that health record system to be totally interchangeable across multiple hospitals, uh, multiple telemedicine centers, <clears throat> and the data from these multiple health centers need to be integrated into the patient's EHR system. And we need to make it clear that the patient has ownership of this data and the patient can decide, uh, you know, with whom and when to share this data. <clears throat> so again, uh, we can uh, use, uh, as I said earlier, we can get rid of conventional record li linking and we can switch to uh, biometric identification. Uh, so we can do uh, fingerprint recognition, we can do patient recognition just using a phone, right? We actually don't even need a fingerprint scanner. We can use the smartphone's camera to do uh, uh, fingerprint scanning. And we can uh, do this on the phone directly. So we can, uh, have, we can deploy a smartphone-based uh, biometric identification on the phone itself. So that way, you know, the patient does not remain, need to remember the hospital number, ID, et cetera. Okay, and as I mentioned earlier, we can uh, try to digitize the pathology lab uh, so that uh, the images are integrated into the patient health record, uh, number one. And, and those uh, electronic health records are integrated within the hospital's electronic health record system. And as has been already said earlier, then the pathologist can provide diagnosis from anywhere. So the key point about the electronic health record integration here is that, you know, the, the expert, the doctor will not just look at uh, 
the uh, <clears throat> images being sent, but also for, uh, possibly look at the patient's medical history. So all that information is going to be available to the patient, uh, to the doctor. And then uh, we can use AI where possible to generate the diagnosis. So that way we can, you know, reduce the need of an expert. So we, we're not necessarily totally trying to eliminate the expert, but we can, you know, reduce the need of an expert and only uh, depend on the expert for more serious cases. And we can also uh, do the same with x-rays. So there are um, a lot of low-cost, low-dose low dose, uh, digital x-ray technology that is available. Uh, this is affordable and portable. But at the moment, uh, you know, uh, these are not uh, designed for remote locations. Uh, but it is possible for somebody to do uh, research on this and uh, develop these solutions. So there is potential for this. Um, <clears throat> and then, as I said earlier, uh, we can combine this with EHR, uh, which will make uh, remote diagnosis feasible. And also uh, combining this uh, with a mobile uh, EHR enables the radiologist to input diagnosis from anywhere, okay? So, uh, you know, a radiologist would be able to see on his phone uh, uh, the, the images, uh, uh, the X-ray images, and then to input the diagnosis uh, directly into the EHR system from anywhere in the world. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we can uh, combine this with AI to do 3D reconstruction from 2D images, and that will help uh, replace uh, CT scans uh, partially, at least partially, not necessarily completely. So the question is, is AI an opportunity or a challenge uh, in healthcare in a developing country? Okay, so that is the question. And so I, I strongly believe that uh, AI technology is becoming easier than ever. Um, and, you know, we call this the democratization of AI. And AI technology is accessible to everybody, every country. Um, developing countries provide, you know, uh, lots of opportunities for uh, trialing new methods in remote settings, okay? So it's an ideal uh, playground for AI technologies to be tested. And there is, you know, lots of data available uh, in lots of uh, difficult uh, healthcare settings. And this provides uh, healthcare providers with lots of opportunities to partner and be in the forefront of this AI revolution. So that's what I believe. Um, so just to summarize, um, <clears throat> um, so what I mentioned is that, you know, we uh, really need a standards compliant interoperable EHR for multi-hospital sharing. Uh, we need to be careful about privacy uh, and data ownership. We need to put that in the hands of the user. We need to educate the user in terms of what that means. Uh, we can uh, switch to telephone-based telemedicine for better outreach and lower cost. And we want to provide at any time, at anywhere services, okay? Uh, we can uh, switch to digital pathology for better utilization of experts. Uh, we can use AI on the smartphone uh, to solve uh, issues of, uh, you know, availability of experts. We can switch to low-cost x-rays and other uh, medical devices. Uh, so there are lots of low-cost medical devices being av available. And we can combine these low-cost devices with state-of-the-art AI solution software, okay? So, so that way, one, on the one hand, we are reducing the cost of the hardware, but we are putting in the best AI technology available. Uh, so that way, we can provide uh, the similar kind of benefit as more expensive solutions, at least uh, for a lot of the use case scenarios. And this provides opportunities to develop innovative solutions uh, in developing countries such as Nepal. Uh, thank you.
If you have any questions, uh, please ask me. Thank you, Suresh Zik. So, it was a nice presentation. Uh, I think AI yeah, will not be a challenge to a physician. Uh, it must be very helpful, but your low cost means uh, how low? That will always be a question from our management about the cost. Uh, and uh, because the output from these type of uh, devices uh, will not be earning anything. So this will be only the expenses and for the social aspects. So uh, your low cost means how low? <laughs> well, AI software is free, okay? So the software is free. The software is free. So, but uh, there is a cost. But there is a cost involved, uh, obviously, in terms of the expert, in terms of developing these solutions. That provides an opportunity, right? to uh, try to uh, monetize this. So the key point here is that, you know, the cost of this kind of solution is always going to be lower than uh, an existing solution. So the existing solution might be using an expert or the existing solution might be using a more expensive uh, solution, such as a CT scan. So for example, uh, using a biplane X-ray device uh, with an AI-based uh, 3D reconstruction is always going to be, you know, 10 times to 100 times uh, lower compared to a CT scan solution. Um, similarly, um, <clears throat> using a phone-based uh, diabetic retinopathy solution uh, is going to be much more uh, lower cost um, than um, providing uh, an expert in every remote location. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Suresh, sir, for your very insightful presentation. So you have covered all the uh, AI and uh, rural healthcare. Uh, I'm just wondering when we can uh, see uh, some of your research projects so, uh, so that we can implement in rural area like in Nepal. So do you have any time so that because, uh, because these, these things are really helpful for developing countries and, and you can do yeah, some so trial in rural areas. So. Yeah, so that, that's a very important uh, question. Um, so, uh, for the diabetic retinopathy project, um, uh, we are currently building our smartphone-based uh, diagnostic software. And once that is completed, um, uh, we will be uh, doing a trial in a remote uh, location uh, in a number of uh, outreach centers in, in the collaboration with the Lincoln Hospital. And that way, we will be able to uh, evaluate the effectiveness of these kinds of solutions. So this is a, obviously an extremely important point. Uh, having a, a, you know, we need to uh, test this out in a realistic setting. And also, we need to have a rigorous uh, uh, evaluation in terms of the effectiveness of this uh, solution. And, you know, we want to do this and we want to publish the results of uh, this evaluation. Um, and that will provide an, a, some sort of uh, guidance in terms of how effective the current uh, existing AI technology is uh, in these kinds of settings. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, uh, might be there are some questions. Uh, so uh, many people are also listening to us. So some of them share the video and some of them are just listening to us. So if, if you have any questions to Professor Mananda.
please share with us. And any questions from other sites, like in Patan Hospital? Rajanji? Rajanji, Rajanji, sir. Okay, good question, Patibar Singh, sir. I would like to introduce uh, Santos. Santos Sitola is here. He is CEO from Anapsis. So, who are you? You telemedicine, or a teleconference for devices or more? Did he come here and buy it, sir? Oh, excellent. Uh, excellent. Hello, everyone. It was a very wonderful presentation, and thank you, Dr. Koirala, for inviting me. And it's a great opportunity to learn about a lot of telemedicine revolution that is going on in Nepal. So basically, uh, Anipsis is a uh, unified communications company, and we do a lot of innovation in unified communication. Till now, we are only working on a commercial way by deploying our service and hardware to the commercial organization. But now we feel it's a uh, great time to uh, be in touch with the telemedicine sector and offer the telemedicine solution, incorporating different uh, software and hardware with uh, customizing the API and SDK that we have. So now I think uh, it's a great time for the rural areas to get connected uh, with innovative and user-friendly uh, technology and most possibly the BIOD platform like Bring Your Own Device platform. Uh, I think uh, uh, on our two presentation, most of the participants, uh, they had uh, emphasized uh, uh, the point of like BIOD uh, collaboration. So uh, not to mention the different hardwares like uh, uh, telemedicine card, which is uh, like universally accepted all over the world. And uh, most of our solution, we are totally interoperable with different legacy equipment like Polycom, Danworth, and Cisco. So uh, there is a question, like most of the people, they have invested vigorously on Polycom or Cisco-based platform devices. So uh, always uh, there is a chance, like they feel, we have to have another Polycom or Cisco on the other, other endpoint, or we cannot connect with each other. But we are totally inoperable with uh, all the endpoint that are currently working in the market. And uh, together, I think uh, we can suggest you and technically we can help you deploying the different uh, telemedicine solution. In the Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Santoshi. Uh, Rajan, the next time I've asked him to present, we have two weeks and uh, from his IT site, technical site, he will be presenting something. Okay, so yeah, that will be wonderful. So we'll have some sharing from Santos. So let's... Okay, so is there any other questions to Professor Man? There are questions. Our people hospital were letting us know, Doctor Chidi. Are you working on ESR as well? When they letting us. Yeah, I think that is for Suresh, Well, actually, yeah, I would want to pass that to um, Hemant and Ravi. Uh, so I think uh, uh, they are working, the uh, Vizac uh, is working on EHR. So they will, it might be good to, for them to provide uh, some insight into, you know, what is it they're building and how uh, standards compliant it's going to be. I think we have a problem with the mic. Hemant, sir. I think, yeah, he can also. Uh, EHR system, um, and uh, the, they are trying to address um, uh, the issues uh, that I've mentioned. So, uh, so they're they're trying to build an EHR system that can run on multiple platforms, and it's going to be uh, compliant with, uh, for example, ICD-10 codes uh, and uh, 
it, it could serve uh, the needs of both the hospitals and uh, the patient as well. In addition, um, the solution that is being built uh, also has got uh, uh, differential diagnosis capabilities. So that means uh, given um, the patient uh, uh, medical condition, uh, it can automatically offer uh, potential diagnosis. Uh, so this is a system uh, still uh, currently being built. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I think um, um, well, uh, we hope that, you know, um, technologies that are being developed in Nepal uh, will, can address uh, the needs of uh, uh, remote uh, <clears throat> uh, patients from remote locations and uh, integration with uh, multiple EHR systems. So, uh, so in addition to WISAC, also, you know, a lot of uh, other companies, uh, so that has already been mentioned, such as Biolpata, uh, Possible Health, etc. So they are also developing uh, uh, lots of solutions. And the focus uh, has to be on interoperable EHR systems. So that's very important. And the key point here is that, you know, so if you look at um, um, HMIS, uh, data collection in Nepal, so at the moment, uh, all the hospitals, or at least a number of, uh, at least one hospital from every district in Nepal is required uh, to submit to the Ministry of Health a monthly report on different uh, uh, types of uh, medical conditions that is encountered in that hospital. Um, but this data is entered manually. So what is actually required is that, you know, the EHR system automatically aggregates the data, summarizes this data, and sends to the Ministry of Health. So there's a lot of error when there's manual uh, data input. Um, uh, so we want to, uh, what is needed is that, you know, the patient is automatically recognized uh, by the system so that there's no, no loss of data. Uh, and data about that patient the same patient from multiple hospitals are automatically integrated and uh, and the hospital is able to aggregate the data uh, on a monthly basis basis uh, from all the patients in that hospital and is able to send that automatically without having a human being enter that data again because that's the point where the error happens uh, to the Ministry of Health. So all of these things uh, need to be addressed, and uh, so this is also a big opportunity uh, to develop uh, these type of solutions in Nepal. Thank you, Suresh, sir. Uh, are there any questions of the absent hand pass, sir? On the screen as well. If you have any questions, just please pass. Okay, if not, then yeah, we are now at end of our uh, uh, trained uh, inter hospitals sharing sessions. So, uh, if we don't have any questions, so I have to thank all the participating sites. Uh, thanks to uh, Professor Swiss. Manander for your valuable time and early in the morning from your uh, from the uh, University of York as well and thanks for all the, the hospitals and thanks for all the technical persons who uh, helped to make this event successful and thanks for uh, YTAC and uh, thanks for other uh, uh, persons who participated in the in this sharing sessions uh, by listening audio and sharing the video. So yeah, I think uh, now, uh, so we, we, we would like to see you on the next 11 in the hospital sharing sessions. So we will send uh, uh, the information related to that sessions uh, uh, in after a week or so. And uh, uh, I think yeah, will be uh, this uh, this sessions is recorded, so uh, 
uh, I think uh, Nirajanji will uh, uh, will work on this recorded sessions, and I think this session will be available in our YouTube channel as well. But before that, I think Nirajanji will consider this uh, for the consent. So uh, I think thank you, thank you very much for your uh, participation and supporting NUN and telemedicine society of Nepal.